Welcome back to another Hearts of Iron 4 video. Today I'm going to be giving you guys 10 tips that are going to really, really help you in multiplayer. And before people start trying to say that some of these things don't really help in multiplayer, every one of these things I'm going to show you helped me do this before 1942 when the Allies actually rage quit. This was in a multiplayer game and the Allies and the Comintern both completely just rage quit because Japan kind of started pushing through. It, it was a great game. But all these things I'm going to show you guys are going to help you accomplish this kind of stuff in multiplayer because this is what helped me accomplish this kind of stuff. So now let's go ahead and get into the video. So for the first tip, I'm going to be showing you guys how to check what your real value of the templates are. Now, what I mean by this is, say, for example, if we look at this tank division, it says our soft attack is 254. Even though if we look down here, our soft attack is definitely not going to be 254 for the templates. Now, here's how you check this. So, what you do is you find the templates under a general. Uh, right now, we have Rommel, so we're just going to go ahead and select Rommel's tank divisions, okay? Now, here is one of those Spirit tank divisions. Now, remember, our soft attack, it says it's 254. Now, if we select the templates little icon for the tank, the 254 soft attack is really... 227 now the reason that is is because whenever you're inside of your recruit and deploy tab here and you're messing around with templates it's expecting you to be using the full amount of the most sophisticated modern equipment you have so since we have for example currently in our game we are sitting on panthers we have 1943 tanks now the template is basing the stats off of if this template had only those 1943 tanks with the upgrades compared to what the real value is instead of that 254 it's really down to 235 which gives you a better idea of how equipped the division is now after showing you guys that tip that also ties into two other things first off make sure you go into your template for really advanced divisions go to edit and for the second thing go into equipment and disable all the extra equipment that you're going to get now if you're in the very early stages of your game it's better to just uncheck use new equipment now here's why you would do this only for really good divisions because of this soft attack thing i was showing whenever you do this it pretty much makes sure that those divisions will have exclusively using those really good weapons and really good equipment now, the reason you would want to do that for the really good divisions and leave the normal ones alone is because that way it prioritizes, say, these tank divisions to get the best equipment possible, which means they're going to actually keep these values compared to it being lowered over time. That, that's kind of the idea behind that, but basically if you want, say, infantry divisions for defense, you might want to leave it on for those, but... Most of the time what I'll do is I will go to garrison divisions, in this game I did not, but I'll uncheck this in the very beginning and just, I'll just leave this checked but turn off the German infantry equipment like this and just make them use basically any kind of extra equipment that we get from captured countries, saving the really good guns for our troops over on the eastern front and the western front that are going to be in combat so they don't suffer any kind of penalties. Now for the third tip I'm going to be showing you guys, it's how to basically draw divisions away from ports for naval invasions. So here's what happens. Whenever you have a garrison order on divisions, what they'll end up doing is they will pretty much guard all of this area. So if, say, for example, we get naval invaded over here and there's not enough divisions to go and fight that, the AI will sometimes pull divisions off of a port and go over and attack. This is for any kind of garrison order that you use whatsoever. So... One way you can exploit this is let's just select these guys right here. Just completely random, okay? Now, what we're going to do is put these cavalry, and I would never actually use these kind of divisions to naval invade, by the way. This just to use as an example. You would basically do something like this. You would just set it up to naval invade here, uh, here. Let's just set up these guys here. And... Uh, Let's set these guys up here. Now, what's going to end up happening, and actually I will move one voice crack, I'm sorry. Uh, I will use one of these divisions to go up here so you guys can see beforehand. Well, actually, let's move them over here. So, as you can see, there's only currently a few guys actually guard... Oop, I've got to tell my divisions to stop going forward. Uh, now, if we just go ahead and select these guys to do this, create a new task force. I'm just trying to get it to where you guys can actually see the entire coast and watch what happens. So, 
the AI is currently using regular garrison orders. So if we were to go ahead and launch our attack, okay, we don't have enough days. Mm, you know, it's close enough just for the sake of the video, I'm sure. So what's going to happen is once these guys end up landing, they're going to start moving from the other ports and actually try to reinforce this port. So what you could do is have another naval invasion set to go somewhere near it. Now, let's see, are they going to actually do it? Oh wait, I don't think they were on a garrison order. Let me turn the AI back on. Yeah, see, now what will end up happening is if they don't have the majority of the coast defended, they'll actually start pulling troops off of other ports. So if you've actually got a really good kind of, you know, defense going on or a really good naval invasion kind of setup, you can usually do something like this in the bottom right of the map. And let's just go over here to tag England really quick. Is there anything else moving? Oh, the AI's... No, it is on a garrison order. Hmm. Okay. Something over here would probably be better, actually. Alright, now I'm not really entirely sure how I can show you this and ignore this. I just messed this up a second ago trying to get over this. But I don't know how I could show this to you guys a little bit easier. But decryption and encryption will actually help you in battles in the Navy and the Air War. So, I forget the exact value... But as long as you're one level above the enemy's level of decryption or encryption, it actually will give you bonuses in terms of finding enemy ships like submarines. It helps you hide your sub detection. And actually, now that I think about it, I might be able to show you guys in here with these. Um, let's see. Sub visibility. Is it actually saying under here? No. Surface detection? No. Basically though, as long as your encryption is higher than the enemy's decryption and vice versa, it will help you hide from or actually find enemy ships a lot easier. Now this tip is something that I get called out for all the time in multiplayer games and it's hilarious when people actually see it go into effect because it wins almost every single time. So AA is actually really good as a cheap version of anti-tank weapons. Now here's why. If we look here at, say, the 1943 era, anti or the anti-air weapons, the piercing is 88 on these things. Now, the armor on a 1943 tank is way higher. It's actually 90. It's only two higher than the current piercing level. But then if we look at a level behind, the armor is 80, which means, really, 1943 anti-aircraft weapons can pierce 1942 era tanks and it basically works that way going back the piercing on 1940 uh, anti-aircraft guns is 60 the armor on a 1940 tank is 80 but then a tier behind is 60 so basically anti-air can pierce one level behind the same year's version of tanks so a 1943 aa gun can pierce a 1940 you know, to tank and further back, but anti-tank weapons can actually pierce the same year and sometimes higher values. So that's just kind of a weird little thing that I learned. I would never recommend doing it entirely for the purpose of piercing. If you're going to go for anti-tank, I always recommend getting anti-tank because it also accounts for heart attack and stuff like that, which AA just doesn't even come close to comparing. Usually in some of these cases, like the heart attack is about half. But still, if you're in a kind of a bind, because this does not require any kind of tungsten compared to anti-tank weapons that do. So if you ever get in a bind and you don't have the resources available, anti-air can work very well as a backup means to anti-tank weapons. Just remember that it's really cool and it's really funny to see someone's reaction when you do this in multiplayer and they're wondering how in the world did a 1940 AA gun just pierce their 1941 tanks. Back on the naval invasions, the naval invasion technology, or more specifically transport technology, will actually decrease the penalties from normal divisions invading and also increase the amount of defense the divisions have, along with the other stuff that you already know, like increases the amount of troops, but more specifically, it removes penalties from attacking over rivers, it removes naval penalties, and stuff like that. Now, I'm going to show you guys right here how much of a bonus, so we're just going to go ahead and let this go through about a day. We're going to go ahead and let these guys get close, naval invading, all right, and stop. So right now we can see that our penalty to naval invading is 45%. Well, if we were to go ahead and unlock the second version of the technology through cheats, that 45% just dropped down. Let's go through a day to 43, and then if we get the final technology, it's actually a lot more uh, if we do it here. 
Now instead of 43, it's down to 37. So you can actually remove about 13% of the penalties that you would get normally by naval invading. Now for garrison divisions and stuff like that, it's not that big a deal. Compared to a 40 width tank division or something like that that you might be using, that's a pretty big bonus to help you out with that. So really we have, well, most of the penalties here are really from the fort that we're attacking. But if we looked up here, is there a fort? Actually, there is. Did, did the guy build forts? All, oh no, he just like built forts in his... Uh, Okay, never mind. So, one more thing regarding naval invasions. Uh, I know this is more of a naval invasion tip video, but you can actually manually assign divisions to help with shore, bar uh, shore bombardment bonus. We're just going to go ahead and assign a... Well, they have plenty of work. They'll be able to hold out for a little while. Uh, basically, here's what you do. You can actually manually order navy groups to do shore bombardment bonuses pretty much without having to have them on convoy invasion or naval invasion support. So if you have them on naval invasion support, they'll actually follow the troops from the target to there compared to, and then they'll just support one or two of the naval invasion landings. Now, if say for example, you were Japan and you were attacking down the coast or something like that, that's when this could come in handy to just help with coastal battles. Or if you're Germany and you want to have a shore bombardment bonus, put the ships over here by Danzig. Now, here's how you do it. So you just find a group with battleships in it. We'll just select this one right here. Tell them to hold after they've been selected and they're highlighted down here. Right click the territory you want them to help fight. So now the ships will leave the bay and they'll go there. And as you can tell, actually the enemy defense, they're now providing a shore bombardment penalty. Now with a larger fleet, you'll get a bigger bonus, but Still, this is a pretty cool trick to use inside of games if you don't want to have them on naval invasion support and you just want to pretty much just use them for shore bombardment and you're never intending to naval invade anywhere. That's still a pretty cool trick. Now, for the last thing I wanted to go ahead and show you guys, don't forget you can change the priority for theaters and templates. Now, here's what you do. You go into your uh, thing here, the division, and you just make sure to put them up here on Elite. Now what this means is these divisions will get the highest level of equipment first compared to if you have them on default they'll get kind of a mix of both old equipment and new equipment and then reserve it just means these are the last guys to get any kind of equipment whatsoever so really for infantry divisions like this, you want to leave them on medium but for tank divisions for any kind of specialized template like this that you're going to be doing a lot of attacking you want them on elite one thing I do is I leave the just 20 width version on default, and then I'll make a 40 width version on Elite. You can also do the same thing for the theaters, which means every division in that theater, uh, theater will get priority over the other theaters. And also, don't forget your reinforcements here. You can actually decide if really the divisions that you're recruiting are going to get upgrades first, like better equipment, or is your stuff going to go over to the troops on the front line first versus, well, this means that uh, your equipment will go to training new divisions first. So really guys, that is all the 10 things I want to show you guys. Now hopefully this video has helped you out and taught you a couple interesting new things and maybe you guys will be able to use these and I know it's mostly naval stuff, but still I want to go and share this with you guys. If you guys know some things that you think will help people out, don't forget to go down below and tell people. So thank you for watching, I'll see you guys next time. Stay awesome.